Every building tells a story, and a group of barn detectives are solving the mysteries of Ohio's history and climate change by dating wooden structures. So we're in Apple Creek, Ohio, and this uh, barn here is owned by Brandon Emerson, and uh, he's interested in understanding when the barn was built. So I'm the fifth generation Emerson to live here. We were dairy farmers up until about 15 years ago. My father, who's 65 now, he said ever since he was a kid, they've been saying it's 100 years old. So we've always been saying it's 100 years old for the last 60 years. After today, Brandon will be able to say with certainty how old this family barn is. A team from the College of Worcester Tree Ring Lab will take inventory of the construction of the barn and core wood samples from the beams. After some analysis, the team will be able to tell Brandon what his family has been wondering for many years, just when exactly the barn was built. We're gonna do it in dendrochronology to date the year, and maybe even the season of the year that these beams that make up this barn were cut from the old growth forest that used to be here. We're in Johnson's Woods. This old growth forest is a great example of what the pioneers came across when they started their move westward. The importance of an old growth woods as far as dating a structure is that this woods here holds trees that are around 350 to 400 years old. So that tree that's living today has a calendar date on the outer ring of 2012 because that was the last year that grew on the tree. So now we're in the winter of 2012, so we won't see the 2013 ring until next spring. By taking core samples from these trees, we can develop a base chronology that's calendar dated and use that to cross date the beams and cores that we would take from a uh, structure. So the unique signal that these trees have will also be in the structures. I love dating barns. It's an interesting way we can use tree rings and uh, use living chronologies to build these floating chronologies, which give a hard date to the calendar year. And historical societies, they really appreciate that. Well, the first thing I always look at when I walk into a barn is to see if it has a hay track and what the hay track has caused. The hay track came around in the late 1800s, and uh, it was not necessarily a good thing for the barn. It was helpful for the farmer, but a lot of times you'll see, like in this barn, that they like to cut out the beams. Luckily in this case, they actually resupported with some iron and wood bracing. A lot of times you'll see they just knock out beams and then, you know, a couple hundred years later, well, the roof starts to spread the barn out or worse. You can get a pretty good idea from the type of beams that you look at in the barn, the hand hewn and the saw marks generally put it in sort of a slot of an area. We took cores throughout the main structure and a couple from the addition of the barn and we had estimated that it was built somewhere before the 1860s or pre-Civil War. I guess 1838 and I have no idea so I'm not a scientist at all. The Civil War began in February of 1861 Greg, Nick, and Brandon's guesses were pre-Civil War estimates. As it turns out, Brandon wasn't all that far off with his guess of 1838. And what we found was that the trees were all cut in 1845. It appears that they were cut in either the fall of 1845 or the winter. The ground would have been hard. It would have been an opportune time to go and take trees down and prepare them for, uh, for the barn. You may still be wondering how exactly they use tree rings to date wood. In addition to the core samples, you'll need a microscope and computer software. So this is a core that we took yesterday at the Emerson Barn. What we have here is this is the early wood, and this dark brown wood is called the late wood, and that's one year's growth. What's really important at this point is essentially making sure that we sand this really well. So this is a really nice surface. And the other thing you note is that as I scroll through here on the screen, you can see there's differences in the ring width. So when we match those patterns from core to core and beam to beam within the barn, and then match it to the, the living tree chronologies we have surrounding this barn basically throughout Ohio, we'll be able to tell you what the calendar date is, plus or minus zero for each of those rings. You can see there's a lot of variability in the rings. This is probably a drier year, wetter year, drier year. And it's that characteristic pattern that you see across that screen um, that's replicated from core to core 
that's going to ultimately allow us to date it with tree and chronology like you'd have it out at Johnson Woods or on the campus here. Trees kind of record the climate of where they are. Trees in Ohio respond to precipitation mostly, so when we look at the tree rings, we know the precipitation for Ohio. And on the other hand, trees in Alaska respond to temperature. So when we're coring those trees in Alaska, we're learning about the temperature over the past hundred years. It's important to note that Greg and his team use this dating information to study climate change, noting wet seasons and droughts, and the effect that had on the landscape. In the early 1800s, about the time they cut the trees down, there was a pretty major moisture deficit at that time. And is that related to removing the forests, draining the wetlands, and other things that happened with settlement here? Does that dry out the atmosphere? Are there human aspects of drought, or is that a natural change that occurred in the early 1800s? So that's kind of a case study that's interesting. The future experiments are more the users of our data. So we generate these data and then we send them to communities that work on modeling the future. And those models need to be calibrated with something that actually did happen in the past. And so we argue that, well, it's, it's really important to understand the past because how are you gonna understand what's potentially uh, possible in the future? Brandon hopes the future of his family barn include more generations of Emersons. It's got a lot of history, obviously, with five generations of um, Emersons growing up here, and it'd be nice to, five generations from now, have someone say, yeah, I'm 10th generation, we've been on this farm. Whether there's someone's farming here or not, hopefully this barn is still standing. 